Josh Gordon is back on the field for the Cleveland Browns. But what is his fantasy value here in Week 12? And there were a slew of injuries in Week 11 that will cause some dramatic shifts in the fantasy football landscape for the rest of the season. I'll give you the up-to-the-minute news that you need to have an edge on the waiver wire. And as always, I'll be answering a few of your questions from YouTube and Twitter. It's all on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Everybody, welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I am your host, Nick, also known as Clickwood, and I am here twice a week, every week, to answer your questions and give you the advice that you need to win your fantasy football leagues. Guys, we're going to start off right away with the biggest news of the day. Adrian Peterson has officially been suspended by the NFL Now, this whole situation has been crazy all season. We didn't really know exactly what was happening here. We know that he was placed on the commissioner's exempt list, and uh, that had some weird ramifications to it. We didn't really know if it meant that he was being suspended during that time or not, or, you know, if when he was off that exempt list, if, if he was actually going to be allowed to play again this season. Turns out that he is not going to be allowed to play again this season, at least from what it looks like at this time. Obviously, Peterson's camp and the NFLPA, they seem to believe that they can figure out a way to make sure that he does get on the field this season. But honestly, the way things are looking, I just don't see it. I mean, it sounds like they're going to actually appeal the whole situation and try and actually get a a way for Adrian to get onto the field. The problem is, is that the the person who will actually be reviewing that appeal is Commissioner Roger Goodell. Now, Roger Goodell actually released a letter today that was a, a letter to Adrian Peterson, and basically it completely just obliterated everything. You know, I mean, the guy basically just tore Adrian Peterson a new asshole. And, um, I mean, he called him everything from basically an irresponsible parent to a violent thug, uh, not necessarily with those words, but basically he said that he's nowhere near being ready to get back on the field because his conduct off the field has not gotten any better. Uh, Peterson was busted with some marijuana as well during the season, if you remember correctly. So this whole thing has just gotten completely out of control. Peterson's life is obviously pretty well spiraling out of control. Now, I will say one thing. For those who are going to complain about the fact that Adrian Peterson has been suspended already for the the beginning of this season, guys, he wasn't suspended. (laughs) I mean, he sat out. But if your employer pays you for, what was it now, two and a half months of work at this point? If my employer pays me for two and a half months of work and I'm sitting on my couch not doing anything, that's not a suspension. That's a vacation. And that's what Adrian Peterson's had. So far, Adrian Peterson has been paid about seven and a half million dollars to sit out this season by the Minnesota Vikings. This is not a decision coming from the Vikings. This is coming from the NFL. Minnesota has already paid him that money. It's kind of interesting because they're really the thing that they're really the group that's getting screwed out of this the most because their player obviously is kind of the rock star of their team. And, uh, you know, it's it's a real bad situation, obviously. But more importantly to them, they've had to go out and, you know, try and find other running backs, but they haven't been able to use their salary cap to do so because Peterson's giant salary is still coming out because he's on this exempt list. So it sucks now because they're basically going to miss their they're starting running back for the entire season, save for one game because he did play in week one. And that's the kind of thing that's going to come up time and time again with situations like this if the NFL doesn't change things. So, you know, we look at this from an NFL standpoint, and it's terrible for the Vikings, obviously. I don't agree with what the NFL is doing. 
Um, because like I said, I think that there needs to be a stronger emphasis on exactly what they're going to do in situations like this. But what I will tell you is that from a fantasy standpoint, Adrian Peterson at this point is basically completely droppable in almost every single format. The only place where you're obviously going to want to keep him is keeper formats. But even then, we don't know what's going to happen. At the end of this season, it sounds a lot like the Minnesota Vikings could end up cutting Adrian Peterson. And the reason I say that is because he is actually not due any more guaranteed money for the remainder of his contract. He does have a huge contract next year, but the thing is is that the team could very realistically decide that they don't want to deal with this anymore. This whole situation has been too ugly PR-wise, and that Adrian Peterson, like I said, he's not due any more guaranteed money. They can cut him without a penalty. If they would have cut him this year, there would have been a giant salary cap penalty for doing so. But the reason that they're keeping him on the team is to avoid that, in my opinion. So I do expect that Adrian Peterson will be on a new team next season. It could be a team like, say, Indianapolis that is currently really struggling at running back, but they are so stacked everywhere else. This team would be a potential Super Bowl contender if they had Adrian Peterson on their on their roster. To be honest with you, they're a Super Bowl contender without Adrian Peterson. But if you have Andrew Luck and Adrian Peterson in the same backfield, whew, that could be ugly real quick for NFL defenses. So... That's the type of offense that I would like to see Peterson go into. Um, you know, of course, he could end up on a team like the Jets or, you know, any of these, a number of these other teams that have running back concerns and running back problems. But the bottom line is that this season, Adrian Peterson, it's a lost season. It sucks. He was a top five player in almost every single draft. But at a certain point, we have to just be able to decide that it's over. I told you guys when he first got suspended, when we first heard about this whole situation, and when I, and when I say suspended, I use that term really loosely again, but when he was first listed as being out and not playing on the field for the Vikings, I said, you should probably drop this guy. And I still stand by that. I don't believe that he will play football again this season. And if you have him on your roster still, I mean, if if you don't need the roster spot, fine. If, if you're really under the impression that he's going to be able to play, but I just don't personally see it. I don't see how he gets back on the field. One guy who will be on the field, though, this upcoming week, Josh Gordon is finally back. He has served his, what, 10-game suspension for the Cleveland Browns. He will play this weekend. Instantly a must-add in every single league if he is available, and there are plenty of leagues where Josh Gordon is still available. You need to be out there right now making him a very big priority on the waiver wire if he is available in your league. Hopefully you guys have been listening to this for the past couple of weeks because I've been saying Josh Gordon's coming back, Josh Gordon's coming back, get him on your roster before everybody else tries to get him, and hopefully you already have him and you didn't have to waste a waiver wire claim on him. Hopefully you were just able to get him as a free agency pickup, or maybe you know you you were in like a an auction bidding system or something like that and you were able to get him super cheap. Hopefully that helped you guys out, but if it didn't, now is the time. This guy is an absolute monster. The NFL's leading receiver, excuse me, from a year ago. The guy has just absurd talent. Legitimately number one overall wide receiver talent. There's no question about that. But at this point in time, we do have to be honest with ourselves and understand that he has not been practicing with his team. He doesn't have any chemistry with the offense. He doesn't really know what's going on with the team at this point in time. There's a lot of controversy in that roster right now. Ben Tate, for example, recently released by the Browns, and that's something that we'll talk about here in a moment. But you look at this type of an offense as a team that has been quietly a lot better than a lot of people expected them to be and now they're going to be getting a superstar talent like Josh Gordon on their roster they've got a guy named Brian Hoyer who's somehow getting the ball to these receivers I don't understand it I I'm not a Brian Hoyer supporter but the guy looks a lot better than what we expected him to be going into the season Josh Gordon right now like I mentioned could legitimately be the number one wide receiver from here on out I don't see it that way I see him as kind of, uh, I, I mentioned before, I think that he's probably going to be a wide receiver too, but the thing is, is that the upside is just so tremendous for this guy that I think that you have to view him a little bit more strongly than that just because he could potentially, like I said, finish as one of the top guys at the position here from this point through the remainder of the season. He has a great matchup this week here in his first game back against Atlanta. It is in Atlanta, so it's a little tougher, but Cleveland has been playing very good football lately. They're they have a legitimate shot to win that division, which is kind of an ugly division. I mean, it's 
all the teams are solid, but none of them are spectacular. But the bottom line is that they, if they're going to win this division, they're going to need Josh Gordon. And I think that he's going to be given a ton of opportunities. I think he's going to be one of the more targeted players in the league once he starts to get his groove back and starts to develop a little bit of that chemistry with Brian Hoyer. And if for whatever reason they do end up sitting Brian Hoyer at some point in the season, it'd be really fun to watch Johnny Manziel throwing the ball to Josh Gordon. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk about here with the Cleveland Browns, they released Ben Tate. I touched on this just a moment ago. Yes, Ben Tate was the starting running back on the team coming into the season. He is now officially just straight up off the roster. Crazy. I mean, the guy went from being, like I said, the guy who was expected to get the majority of the carries to now it's Isaiah Crowell and Terrence West getting almost all of the carries for that team. Very, very interesting. They have kind of been talking smack about Ben Tate on that team for a couple of weeks, and I was really confused by it because most of the time... When coaching staffs are asked a question about a player, they'll usually say something that's, you know, even when a guy's not performing well, they'll be like, you know, he's he's going through some tough times at the moment, but we really think that he can turn it around. This is a guy that has a lot of talent. You know, that kind of coach speak, basically. But they haven't been doing that with Ben Tate. They were basically saying that this guy doesn't have explosion. He doesn't have, you know, this and that. He's not picking up blocks, that kind of stuff. And they just decided, screw it. We're done with this guy. Very, very interesting. Ben Tate was a big-time performer when he was on the Houston Texans. Dude was putting up crazy numbers in relief of Arian Foster, sometimes even in the same game as Arian Foster putting up big games. But now he goes to Cleveland, and they are just not doing anything with him. So not all that unexpected, I guess. I, I guess I I didn't expect him to be released, but I did expect that he would probably be the third guy on the depth chart going forward. We still really don't know who the quote-unquote starter will be in Cleveland, and the reason for it is because the coaches have basically been going off of who's been playing better in practice. So one week, it's Terrence West getting 20 carries, and the next week, it's Isaiah Crowell getting 20 carries, and it's just going to be a crapshoot from here on out. I think most people at this point do believe that it's going to be Crowell. If you want to own somebody in this backfield, if there is one player, I think it's him, but it could, I mean, it very easily could be a week-to-week type of situation and that's really really tough to predict for fantasy football because yeah we might be able to get reports from from uh from practice and say you know okay Crowell's looked really good this week he's probably the guy or you know uh, Terrence West has looked really really good this week and maybe he's going to be the guy that gets all the carries but that's all speculation there isn't really anything coming from the coaching staff on Friday or Saturday that's saying, oh yeah, Isaiah Crowell is going to get the start this week and we're going to give him 20 touches. That's not happening at all. So this is going to be a very tough and very difficult to predict fantasy football running back situation now, but I will say that it is a little bit better now that Ben Tate's gone because we don't have that concern. Now, the other team that I think has a very interesting running back situation here, Denver. Monty Ball and Ronnie Hillman, both unlikely to play this Sunday due to various injuries. Ball has a groin injury. Hillman still recovering from that foot injury. Now, Ball actually re-injured his groin on, I think it was the first or the second play that he was on the field. And that led to C.J. Anderson once again getting the vast majority of the touches for the Denver Broncos. They did lose that game by a pretty significant margin to the St. Louis Rams. And, I mean, nobody really expected that, to be honest. But you look at it like this. C.J. Anderson, nine carries, caught eight passes, though. 17 total touches in a loss. And that's something that you can't overlook. Most of the time, if Denver is behind in a game, it's going to be Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning. And he's going to be looking down the field. In this game, he was more than willing to check the ball down to C.J. Anderson, and that's pretty interesting. I don't expect this guy to be the next, you know, Darren Sproles or the next Reggie Bush from a few years ago where he's catching a ton of passes or anything, but what I will tell you is that C.J. Anderson has a skill set that plays pretty well for the Denver Broncos. He can pass protect just a little bit. He's, I mean, certainly he needs to work on that a little bit, but I think that he has a little bit of confidence from Peyton Manning at this point, and he's putting on a show with some of the touches that he's getting. 86 yards in the passing game. He broke 100 yards this week, despite the fact that the Broncos only put up seven total points on offense, and There's not a whole lot to dislike about this situation right now. With Monty Ball being out, Ronnie Hillman being out likely for the next two to three weeks here, this guy's going to be getting almost all the carries. 
Now, I understand Juwan Thompson could end up seeing some carries. We've seen him snipe a couple of goal line touches earlier in the season, but he was basically unused in this game this past week. And I kind of expect that to be the case going forward. I don't really see much of a situation that Juwan Thompson is going to be getting more than maybe a handful of touches per game. And as long as that's happening, as long as C.J. Anderson is the guy in this Denver offense, I like him as a solid, solid RB2, especially in PPR formats where he can take advantage of his pass-catching skills. So... If he's still out there in your league for whatever reason, you need to be out there acquiring him. And if you have him on your roster, I love him, like I said, as a, as an RB2 and even better as a flex. If he's somebody that you just went and picked up on the fly, this is a premier time to be putting CJ Anderson in as your flex because he's going to put up nice numbers from here on out. Next thing, another running back situation. This one is a little bit less fantasy relevant, but I still want to touch on it because I think it's kind of bizarre, and that was LeGarrette Blunt being released by the Pittsburgh Steelers here on Tuesday. Now, LeGarrette Blunt left the field on Monday despite the fact that his team was winning, and Le'Veon Bell was putting up ridiculous numbers. I understand. I I totally get that LeGarrette Blunt wanted to be on the field. He wanted to get some carries of his own and show what he can do, but he decided that he was going to leave the field showered, and then he left the stadium before the team was out out the, I think they were still on the field when he left the stadium. He got no carries on Monday night, and this is now the fourth team that, that LeGarrette Blunt has left in five seasons, whether it be, you know, leaving in free agency or being released. So obviously, in five seasons to be on that many teams, if you count the Titans, by the way, they were the first team that he was on, um, this guy has the skills to be on an NFL roster, but there's something going on up up in the head, you know? Um, he was arrested earlier this year with Le'Veon Bell for marijuana possession. I believe that was in a car. But just, I, and I don't want to just make speculation here, blind speculation, but given the fact that this guy has been, has made some poor decisions in other areas of his life, it, it seems pretty likely to me like LeGarrette Blunt was probably the culprit of the marijuana possession and Le'Veon Bell was more just kind of there. But it's hard to say. It's really hard to say, and I don't I don't want to make that speculate, speculation. But what we do know is that the guy was facing a suspension coming up at some point, most likely, as is Le'Veon Bell. Probably won't be until next year, though. So it's kind of interesting that the Steelers kept him on their roster after all of this, but clearly this was the final straw. He is gone. And now he's going to be looking for a new team. Him, Ben Tate, Ray Rice, all these guys. All these guys with, you know, possible attitude issues, I would have to assume, with all of them. I mean, Ray Rice, obviously, most people said he was a good guy with the team and and that kind of thing. But there's obvious major PR situations with him. Adrian Peterson could potentially be eventually released by the Vikings. I don't think he will be this year because, like I said, they'll take a huge salary cap hit if they do that. But, you know, all these guys... Major off the field issues, and it's not really anything to do. Well, I shouldn't say with Ben Tate, it is on the field too, but uh, it's not so much to do with their on the field skills. However, there is now an opportunity for one of these guys to potentially find a spot in Indianapolis. Ahmad Bradshaw broke his ankle will likely miss at least the next four or five weeks, probably the remainder of the season, and. Trent Richardson now becomes the comes the de facto starter here for the Indianapolis Colts. A tough situation for that team because, like I said, they have such a ridiculous passing game right now. Andrew Luck looks like a world-class quarterback. The guy's coming into his own for sure, but their running game has been so inconsistent. Ahmad Bradshaw has been great out of the backfield catching passes. Trent Richardson has been awful just at everything. But now Trent Richardson is going to be that team's number one running back. So it's going to be very interesting to see if a guy like a Ben Tate or possibly like a LeGarrette Blunt ends up in Indianapolis. You need to pay attention to the NFL uh, news sources, whether it be ESPN or NFL.com or you know NFL Network or whatever. You need to have some sort of a way to get in touch with that type of information because... If a guy like a LeGarrette Blunt becomes a member of the Indianapolis Colts or, you know, like I said, a, a Ben Tate, I know Ben Tate's been mediocre this year, but if one of those guys does end up on that team, I would be very surprised if they are not going to get at least 
60% of the carries for the Indianapolis Colts. And if that happens, they become a big time fantasy asset in this very high powered Indianapolis offense. So make sure if these guys are available and they do get picked up by the Colts, go out there and acquire them ASAP. Do not wait. Make them a priority on your waiver wire. Another guy who is suffering from an ankle injury along with Ahmad Bradshaw is Denver Broncos tight end Julius Thomas. In that blowout loss to the Rams, he got injured. And this is going to be a tough situation for the Denver Broncos because this guy has been on a torrid pace this season, putting up huge numbers, really putting up some of the best fantasy tight end numbers that we have ever seen. And to miss him potentially for this weekend's game, he's probably going to be a game time decision, but it could be a lingering issue here. This is an ankle injury that you just don't know. We don't know the severity of it. We have heard that he was not in a walking boot and he wasn't limping too badly on uh, in practices early this week. However, that doesn't really say much because he isn't practicing. He's not, you know, at full speed or anything like that. So the the best thing about this is that this isn't the same ankle that he injured before. So, I mean, that's good in one way, it's bad in another way because... It shows that his ankles overall are probably not the healthiest and, you know, potentially he just has weak ankles as a person. But at the same time, though, it's good that it's not a re-aggravation of a previous injury and that that other ankle is kind of seems to be fully healthy at this point. So I think Julius Thomas is somebody that I'm keeping a close eye on here. I'm not trading him away, certainly. But if he plays, you have to have him in your lineup. The guy's just too much of a stud. But be sure to pay attention to it because, of course, if he is out, you are going to need to look elsewhere. Another guy who could potentially miss this weekend's game for the Denver Broncos, Emmanuel Sanders, who has also been on an insane pace, was making a, some great catches. He scored the only touchdown for the Broncos this past week. And Sanders took an absolutely devastating hit during the loss to the Rams, a horrible concussion. Well, it looked really horrible. I guess I don't know the severity of it, but it sounds like there's a possibility that he could play this week. The question is that he needs to be sure that he passes the NFL's concussion protocol testing. And that has been kind of an up and down thing for players throughout the year, whether it be, you know, your Jordan Reeds or other guys like a Wes Welker who have suffered concussions in the past. All these type of guys, they all have, you know, it, it's a very big difference between one concussion to another. It's not just like, oh, he has a concussion, maybe he'll miss one game. It could be multiple, multiple weeks. Jordan Cameron's going through that right now as well. We just don't know when this guy's going to be back. Now, Emmanuel Sanders did tweet a picture about that he uh, was at the club, it looked like, with a couple of ladies on each arm. And, you know, that's a good sign because that shows that he's out there having fun and he's not necessarily suffering from immediate ramifications from the concussion anyway, but he's still going to have to pass those tests. So pay attention to that as well in practice this week. If he does pass the test, obviously he's out there for you. If not, if he isn't out there on Sunday, Andre Caldwell actually saw a little bit of playing time this Sunday, caught his first couple of passes since all the way back in week one when Wes Welker was out. But the guy who gets obviously the biggest upgrade here is Wes Welker himself. Welker then goes from a guy who I was saying a couple weeks ago could potentially be somebody that you drop to somebody that you probably need to be acquiring right now, especially if Emmanuel Sanders or Julius Thomas is out. If one of those guys is out, Wes Welker is going to get a ton of more targets. That's just the way that it is. That's how the Denver Broncos offense works. Next guy up, just like the just like the Arizona Cardinals. They move these guys into the positions and they use them kind of in the same way. So I do think that Emmanuel Sanders, his injury is going to be something I think that he'll probably get over just given the fact that he seems so happy about things still. But we do need to monitor it very closely. The number one waiver wire addition for this week, however, does not come from Denver doesn't come from either of the running backs that are potentially going to replace Ahmad Bradshaw in Indianapolis. It comes from New England. Jonas Gray. This guy has been a monster over the past couple of weeks, especially this past week when he ran for 199 yards on 38 carries. He scored four touchdowns in the win over Indianapolis on Monday Night Football. 67 carries in his past three games. Unbelievable. For a guy who was off the practice squad just a handful of weeks ago, didn't play at all earlier in the season. Now he's looking like a legitimate RB1. 
Seriously, this guy is putting up monster numbers. Now, I will say that this guy is not a superstar talent. There really isn't any part of his game where you look at it and you say, oh, he's super fast or he's super strong or he has great vision or he's making the right moves or, you know, anything like that. He's not a great pass catcher out of the backfield, but he's in a great offense right now. New England's offense is clicking as well as just about anybody's in the league, and the Patriots have no problem running the ball at the goal line. That's something that you cannot overlook. Four touchdowns on the ground. That does not happen very often in today's NFL, but the Patriots are doing it. They don't have any problem giving the ball to Jonas Gray. They're trusting him, and he's performing. So if for whatever reason he is available in your league, he needs to be your number one waiver wire acquisition this week. I believe that he is going to put up monster numbers for the remainder of the season. Nobody's taken that job from him. Shane Vereen is somebody who could potentially still have value in your PPR leagues, but he's not getting the consistent carries to be a valued fantasy asset down the stretch here in my personal opinion. So next guy that I want to talk about, Another running back here, this one from Houston, and another guy who filled in for a starter, and that is Alfred Blue. Now, he looked pretty damn good this past week. He also ran the ball over 35 times. This, this guy took the ball 36 attempts, 156 yards in the win over the Browns. Now, Arian Foster is still dealing with a groin injury, and with Alfred Blue playing as well as he is, it wouldn't be that surprising for me if the if the Houston Texans decided we're just going to sit down Arian Foster for the next couple of games here, maybe just one week even, and just give Alfred Blue one more shot to be the starter here. And I'm not saying that he's going to keep his job once, Al or, um, once Arian Foster comes back, but Alfred Blue has the skills to be a guy who could be a solid fantasy contributor for you pretty much regardless of matchup. Now, they have the Bengals here in Week 12, which sounds like it should be a really tough matchup, but the Bengals haven't been that great lately. And this could be something where Alfred Blue could certainly exploit it. He needs to be a guy who you're out there picking up on your waiver wire as well. I rank him probably third behind Josh Gordon and, of course, Jonas Gray. So be sure to get out there and pick up Alfred Blue for the time being. It's hard to really predict if he's going to be able to get significant carries down the stretch, but Arian Foster has a history of nagging injuries, and it wouldn't be that surprising for him to come back in a game, get re-injured, and then Alfred Blues got the job for the rest of the year. So be sure to get out there and pick up your Alfred Blues if they are available. Next guy, Charles Sims. Finally got some playing time this past week for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He wasn't spectacular. He rushed the ball for just 36 yards on 13 carries. But the nice thing is that we look at this game and we see that Bobby Rainey only got five touches. Doug Martin's completely worthless and Bobby Rainey's basically nothing at this point. I believe Charles Sims will be the running back that you want to own down the stretch here for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We talked about him a few weeks back, and it's finally starting to come to fruition that he is going to get the significant bulk of the carries. However, this is still the Tampa Bay offense. It's not great. They're not going to be able to run the ball most likely for 150 yards a game, but it's the NFL, and starting running backs are just something that are hard to come by. So if you're in a tough situation and you're starting to, you know, mediocre guys, if you've got a Jarek McKinnon or a Matt Asiata in there and, and they're in a, up against a tough matchup and you really just need a guy who's going to get touches, that could be what Charles Sims is for you. So I would be out there trying to acquire him as well. Now, one player who I'm looking at in deeper leagues Latavius Murray of the Oakland Raiders. I think he is worth an add in your leagues that are your 14-team, your 16-team leagues that have deeper benches. And the reason that I'm saying that is because Darren McFadden and Reese Jones-Drew have both been atrocious this season. Neither player has done anything of significant value. The Raiders are atrocious as a team. They're not going to win very many games, if any games this year. It has actually been literally over an entire calendar year since the Oakland Raiders have won a single football game. There's no reason for them to sit there with Darren McFadden and Maurice Jones-Drew, guys who are veterans and haven't done anything. It's time for them to start looking at younger guys on their roster to see what they have. They saw a little bit of what Latavius Murray could do this past week. He got four carries, and he ran for 43 yards on those four carries. He also caught three passes for 16 yards. So 59 total yards despite only touching the ball seven times. That's better than anything that we've seen from any of the other players in this offense this year. Uh, I mean, as far as running backs go, at least. So I look at it like this. Very similarly to Charles Sims, I don't love the situation by any means, but if you can get a guy who is at least going to get potential touches down the stretch here, that could be valuable. 
especially if you're in a situation where you lost guys due to injury, you got, you know, you lost Ben Tate and you lost Arian Foster potentially, Adrian Peterson was on your roster to begin with. You just need guys that get touches at this point. And that's what Latavius Murray, I think, will get. I do expect him to be the highest scoring Oakland Raiders running back down the stretch here for the final, what, six games of the year that we have. So please be sure to be looking at him in your deeper leagues. If you're in a 10-team league, an 8-team league, anything like that, even 12-team league, I'm probably not looking at him at this point, but be sure to, you know, keep an eye on him from a distance and see if he's out there getting the majority of the carries for Oakland this week, go ahead and pick him up. Last thing that I want to talk about before I get into some fan questions, Jeremy Hill. This guy has been a beast for the Cincinnati Bengals since Giovanni Bernard has been out. He was good even when Giovanni Bernard was playing as a complimentary player. Jeremy Hill has averaged 130 yards per game over his past three games. Now, Gio Bernard has only 101 130-yard game all season. So that's pretty damn impressive. Now, what I will say is that Giovanni Bernard is the better pass catcher, but I actually think that Jeremy Hill could be better built to get more touches in this offense. I would not be surprised at all to see Jeremy Hill being the guy who gets the majority of the running back snaps for this team, or at least the runs, you know, as far as straight carries go out of this backfield. Would not be surprising at all. I do still expect, of course, that Gio Bernard is going to be out there for the majority of third downs because he has that explosive ability, and I think that he is still going to be a guy that you obviously want to own here in fantasy football. But when he comes back from an injury, if you can trade him away still before your trade deadline, I do think now is the time to do it. I don't think Gio Bernard is going to continue to give you the type of results that he had at the beginning of the season, and I think Jeremy Hill is going to continue to produce solid numbers down the stretch here. Both guys worth owning. But again, be careful about Gio Bernard. Don't overvalue what he has done earlier in the year because Jeremy Hill has looked like an absolute monster. And I would be very surprised if he hasn't at least secured a running back by committee type approach here in Cincinnati. Now, let's move on to the final segment. We've got a few questions here. It's, you know, the show is getting a little bit long here, so I don't want to go too over, but what I will say is that I do appreciate all of you guys sending in questions to me. Uh, I know the second uh, the second show of the week is usually the one where we get the vast majority of our questions because there's a lot of start-sit type of stuff. You guys want to know, should I play X or should I play Y or should I play Z at your position? And of course, if you have any questions like that, please be sure to tweet them to me at ClickwoodTV or of course, you can leave them in the comment section here on YouTube. But I love answering those questions for you guys because it it really helps me not only just with answering your questions and makes me feel, you know, like a valued member of society, I guess you could say, but uh, it also just helps me better analyze things because I start to see the types of situations that people realistically have with their own teams. I know what I have on my teams, but I have a lot of stuff that, you know, I've been preaching this and this and this, and I don't have guys like, you know, an Arian Foster on my roster in many leagues right now because I was starting to trade him away when I thought that he had, you know, he had been producing at such a good rate, and I don't like the fact that Arian Foster has such a strong history of injuries. So I did have him in a league, I traded him away, and I was able to get a good return for him. But other people, maybe you didn't make that type of a move, and maybe you're sitting there right now and you're wondering, what do I do? I have Alfred Blue as his backup, but I also have Jeremy Hill. Who do I start? You know, those type of questions are really the crux of what fantasy football is. You have to be able to make the right decisions from a week-to-week basis, or at least have a good uh, week from the guy that you do choose. Even if the other guy does end up outscoring him, as long as your guy has a solid enough week, a lot of times that's good enough. So, Again, if you guys are interested in having me answer your questions here on the show, please be sure to tweet them to me or leave them in the comment section below. And I will, of course, do my best to get to them on the show. If I don't, I will do my best then to answer them in the comment section or respond to your tweet prior to Sunday's kickoff. So first question comes from D Dwayne 17899 on YouTube, and he asks, Do you think dropping Larry Fitzgerald for Benjamin is a good move? Now, he didn't really specify which Benjamin it is. I'm assuming that it's Kelvin Benjamin. It could be Travis Benjamin, but I'm going to assume Kelvin Benjamin here because I don't really know why you would pick up Travis Benjamin at this point in the season. But what I will say is that if Kelvin Benjamin is somehow still on your waiver wire, you must be in like a four-team league. 
because this guy is performing like a top 10 fantasy wide receiver this season. He has an unbelievable schedule down the stretch here, one of the absolute best of any wide receiver grouping, and I think that he is going to finish as a potential top 12, top 10 fantasy wide receiver this season, so long as Cam Newton doesn't throw the ball over his head 50 times in a game like he has in the past. So yes, I would drop Larry Fitzgerald for Kelvin Benjamin. I'm not so certain that Larry Fitzgerald is going to continue to produce great numbers with Drew Stanton behind the behind the center. So just, you know, there almost has to be somebody on your roster that's worse than Larry Fitzgerald. But if there isn't, yes, I would drop Larry Fitzgerald for Kelvin Benjamin. Travis Benjamin, no. All right. Next question comes from Zion Andrade. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. I, I apologize. It's, that's a tough last name. Andrade, I think is how you pronounce it. Zion Andrade. All right. Should I trade away Russell Wilson or Colin Kaepernick? Now, this is a real good question because a lot of times we go into the season and we draft a mid-level quarterback like a Russell Wilson and we pair him with another mid-level quarterback like a Colin Kaepernick and we say to ourselves, I'm going to play the matchups. And I'm going to play the matchups is a great way of doing things in fantasy football because you end up usually getting the better end of most games. Now, it can be really tough to predict with guys like Russell Wilson and Colin Kaepernick who don't throw the ball as often as other quarterbacks do. Guys like Tony Romo or guys like Jay Cutler or, you know, guys like that type of range of quarterback who might have gone even a few picks later than these guys are actually easier to predict because you don't have the rushing, which is kind of random. To be completely honest, it is. The rushing is pretty random with quarterbacks. Let's be realistic here. Um... And you have just a more consistency of throwing the ball 30 to 40 times a game. So guys like Russell Wilson and Colin Kaepernick, there is a value in them. But the truth is that they, you have to find the right suitor when you're trading them, okay? If you have a guy in your league who just loves Russell Wilson and he had Carson Palmer as his starter or let's say he had Cam Newton as his starter or has Cam Newton as his starter, uh, guys who are struggling at the quarterback position, this is the type of time where I'm trading away one of these guys at least to try and acquire an upgrade at another position. However, you do also have to keep in mind that you still have to start one of these quarterbacks, I'm assuming. Unless you've got a, a Peyton Manning or something and you're rocking a three-quarterback roster here, uh, you have to start Colin Kaepernick or Russell Wilson every week. So you also have to keep in mind what your team is going to have. And if you, if you look at Russell Wilson and Colin Kaepernick's schedules down the stretch, because they're in the division with probably the toughest group of defenses in the entire league— they both have very tough schedules. And what I'm going to tell you is that I think that if I'm in your situation and I don't have another quarterback like a Jay Cutler or even or, you know, like a, a solid mid-level quarterback, I'm probably going to try and keep both of these guys and play the matchups like I have been all season. Now, if you're in a desperate situation and you know you can get a good amount for a Colin Kaepernick or a Russell Wilson based on the person that you're going to be trading him to, go ahead and make that move. But... From a standpoint of that, I don't really think there's that many quarterbacks that Wilson and Kaepernick are significant upgrades from. I question what you're going to get in return for them. So just go out there and take a look at your waiver wire, see if there's any good quarterbacks, and then go ahead and look at the other rosters, see if there's anybody out there that's really hurting at quarterback, and then see what you can do to move one of them. If you can, great. If you can't, could be worse. You at least have the option to pick the better one on a week to week basis. Third and final question this week comes from Alex4899 on YouTube, and he asks, I have Marshawn Lynch. Who should I try to trade him for? Who's a good replacement for him? Thank you for listening to the podcast this past week because I did talk about why I believe that Marshawn Lynch is going to start to see a little bit of a downgrade in his performance for the remainder of the season. I touched on it just a moment ago. These teams here in the NFC West have an absolutely brutal schedule coming up. You've got Arizona, you've got Seattle, you've got San Francisco, and you've got St. Louis, all of them in the same division, all of them potentially a top 10 defense going down the stretch. So it's very, very difficult to look at those games where you've got so many division games, and that's how the NFL schedules are set up to create extra drama, that you look at those schedules and you see, I've got four division games for the remainder of the year. That's tough to overcome. 
It really is. And Marshawn Lynch has that coming up. He has one of the absolute worst schedules of any running back in the league coming up. Five games against top five fantasy run defenses right now. That is really, really hard to overcome. We saw it this past week. He was not great. And my opinion is that, yes, it is time to move Marshawn Lynch. Now, you asked, who should I try and trade him for? Well, that's a really great question because you have to look, first of all, at your roster. Now, if you're in a situation where you have guys, you have a good number of running backs, let's say you've got, uh, you have a DeMarco Murray, let's say, and you have right now a Marshawn Lynch, you went Marshawn Lynch in round one, and then you went Murray in round two, uh, and then in round three or four, you got another solid running back. Maybe you're in a good situation at this point. Maybe you don't need to trade for another running back. I don't know what the rest of your roster looks like, but I will tell you this. I do think that you have to look at guys who can do a little bit more with the ball. And that's why I'm looking at guys like, let's say, an Eddie Lacy, who has really come on as a receiver in the past couple of weeks. Now, I understand Eddie Lacy's rushing totals have not been good. But the guy is going to put up solid numbers here. He has mostly good matchups coming down the stretch here. He's going to get to play against teams like, you know, the Bears. And he's going to get to play against the Vikings still. And it's just the schedule is a lot better for an Eddie Lacy. Now, what I will tell you is that I would not trade Marshawn Lynch straight away for Eddie Lacy. I would want to get an upgrade at another another position as well. So maybe you throw in one of your wide receivers and the other person throws in one of their wide receivers and hopefully you can get a little bit of an upgrade there. But I actually do like Eddie Lacy slightly ahead of Marshawn Lynch for the remainder of the season. I know that sounds crazy, but I just don't think there are a lot of other guys that you're looking at as being, you know, big time contributors down the stretch here. And, you know, there just aren't a lot of guys that match up with what Marshawn Lynch's current value is. Uh, Lynch right now is pretty well considered a top five fantasy running back, but I don't think you're going to get Jamal Charles for him. I don't think you're going to get Le'Veon Bell, and I certainly don't think you're going to get Matt Forte or DeMarco Murray. So you basically have to look at guys who are lower than him on the rankings right now, and the guys who really come to mind as being close to him, you know, you've got your Arian Foster who's dealing with a groin injury. I don't like that. You've got Eddie Lacy, who I talked a little bit about, who I think is pretty decent. Then you've got guys like Andre Ellington who have a very similar type of situation to Marshawn Lynch with that brutal schedule coming up. But what I will say about Andre Ellington is that I think that he has a better likelihood of having big big time performances down the stretch. And the reason for it is because he does catch significantly more passes than Lynch and he is a much more versatile player in that aspect. But Marshawn Lynch, of course, still a member of the Seattle Seahawks who do love to run the football at the goal line, and Lynch can still sneak into the end zone from time to time and get those touchdowns even in tough matchups that save his fantasy day. So what I'm getting at here is that I do like Marshawn Lynch still to some extent. I don't want to give him away for pennies on the dollar, but I also want to be very sure that I do get him off of my roster if I can for an upgrade at some sort of a position. And it doesn't necessarily have to be at running back because a lot of times people think that just because you are trading away a running back that you have to get a running back in in return. I actually think that that is the wrong way of going about things. My personal opinion and what I've always found to be true is that it's easier to trade people who need a running back for a running back than it is who somebody who already has a decent running back and tell them you need a running back because look look like, look at it like this. If somebody's really strong at receiver, but they're struggling at running back, and let's say you're stronger at running back and you're struggling at receiver, you're kind of the match made in heaven. You trade away your running back, they trade away their receiver, you guys both get a mutually equivalent deal, or roughly equivalent anyway, and something that is going to help both of your teams down the stretch. That's what I would be looking to do with Eddie Lacy. The guys that I would like to target if I'm, or excuse me, not Eddie Lacy, with uh, Marshawn Lynch here. If I'm if I'm trading away a Marshawn Lynch down the stretch here, guys that I want in return at other positions, I'm looking at guys like Kelvin Johnson, who really struggled this past week, didn't really do much. And uh, guys like AJ Green, who are coming back from an injury. Guys like maybe a Randall Cobb, who is quietly an elite receiver right now, but because Jordy Nelson's been doing so much, Randall Cobb has been kind of flying under the radar. I love Randall Cobb. I think that he's getting targeted a ton, and I expect him to get targeted even more down the stretch here. So uh, he's certainly somebody I would be looking to acquire. And then at tight end, 
I would consider trading away a Marshawn Lynch if I could get any of the three top tight ends. Julius Thomas, Rob Gronkowski, or if I could, of course, get Jimmy Graham, I would do that as well. But Julius Thomas is really the one that I think you're most likely to get the best return or most likely to be able to trade Marshawn Lynch for right now. Uh, Julius Thomas obviously coming off of the ankle injury himself, and there might be somebody out there who is fairly low on him given the fact that he's kind of had some down games lately. I'm telling you though, Julius Thomas, if he is healthy, he is going to be an absolute beast down the stretch. The dude's going to put up monster numbers just like he has most of the season, and I fully expect him to finish as a top three fantasy tight end this year along with that uh, Gronk and Graham combo. So, Definitely go out there and try and trade away Marshawn Lynch, but do your best to get what you can in return for him from somebody who could really use a running back or somebody who they think they can use Marshawn Lynch, but hopefully Marshawn Lynch will come and really do nothing for them as you trade him away. With that being said, guys, that is going to do it for today's show. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you did, please be sure to give that video the thumbs up. And also, click the subscribe button so that you can be updated when I put out the next episode. If you have any questions about your lineup for this week's games, or if you're looking to make a trade, or if you just have any sort of fantasy football general questions, I would love to answer those in the comment section below. Or if you can tweet it to me at ClickWithTV, I will do my best to answer those on the next show or like I said, comment or tweet them back at you with a response. Thank you guys so much for listening. Please, please be sure to check back later this week. I will have a preview of the week 12 games. I'll give you guys my busts and sleepers for this week. It will all be on the next episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. Thanks, guys.